Uh, please bear with me to this step by step. Okay, so <clears throat> basically, the uh, for an ideal Fermi gas, we said that we are uh, considering free electrons. Right. So um, we are considering free electrons. Okay, and uh, inside a box. And uh, this is basically supposed to emulate a solid because uh, inside a solid we would expect that there are these uh, atoms sitting in, in some place and the uh, electrons would find it extremely hard to escape out of the solid which means that there is an infinite potential barrier and then wherever the atoms are placed you will find these uh, um, the potential wells and as a first approximation this is taken to be just a flat well Okay, so this becomes a particle in a box with no potential. So this is the uh, first approximation. And in, this is the approximation that we are considering for now. Okay. Hello, Narayan. We're just having a class. Yeah. Okay, so as the first approximation, this is what we are considering. And uh, we had said that epsilon k gets uh, h cross squared by 2m kx squared plus ky squared plus kz squared and we had discussed the concepts of the <coughs> uh, Fermi energy and so on and Fermi sphere. So when you have uh, open boundary conditions, we will only have the first octant as the uh, Fermi sphere. We will not have the full Fermi sphere. Okay? But if you consider periodic boundary conditions, then you would get a full sphere. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, let's think about the full sphere, the periodic boundary conditions, and that will um, uh, that's equivalent to taking a, a open boundary conditions as well. Okay, because the bulk doesn't change much. So then uh, we wanted to consider the specific heat and before considering the specific heat we discussed the Fermi Dirac distribution function. So today we will go over the Fermi Dirac distribution function in a little bit more detail. Okay? Uh, and the reason is that uh, understanding the behavior of the Fermi function as a function of energy and temperature is, uh, is very important to understand the behavior of let's say the total number or the internal energy or the derivative of the internal energy. Okay. So let's start with the total number of uh, or the total or average number of electrons and the average number of electrons at any given temperature is given by n is equal to integral d epsilon f of epsilon and d of epsilon. Okay. So <coughs> now what are these things? The f of epsilon is the Fermi Dirac distribution function. And it tells us what is the probability of occupancy of a state having energy epsilon. So, <clears throat> This is a very important thing and in fact what you will see is that this is the equation that we will be using to figure out what does chemical potential do as a function of temperature. Okay, So <coughs> this is the average number of electrons and uh, why is this given by this because we are saying that at a certain energy in a certain energy window d epsilon around epsilon the density of states is given by d of epsilon. So, which means d of epsilon times d epsilon gives you the total number of states within an energy window of epsilon plus minus d epsilon. And the f of epsilon denotes the probability of occupancy of that, which means if you sum over all the states, you will get the total number of electrons. Okay. So, uh, this is the uh, average number n. And then similarly, we can define the internal energy or the average internal energy which is also the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. <coughs> Let's call it u as integral 0 to infinity d epsilon. Now 
in addition to the f of epsilon d epsilon there is also an epsilon sitting here because now we are summing over all the states but with an energy so each state has an energy epsilon and then rest of the factors will be exactly the same <clears throat> so you can see that the number and the internal energy differ only by this uh, this uh, quantity epsilon okay so uh, this is uh, these are the two formula that we are going to analyze in a, a today and before we go over to the n itself let's first figure out what does this fermi function do okay so the f of epsilon or the fermi dirac function do so the f of epsilon is defined as e to the power beta epsilon minus mu plus 1 okay where beta is 1 over kvt and is actually a function of temperature so it's a temperature dependent chemical potential and the idea is that if you look at this equation this this equation here then the number of electrons is a constant as a function of temperature okay so we are keeping the average number of electrons the same but how does the left hand side remain the same if on the right hand side things are a function of temperature okay so remember f of f of epsilon has temperature explicitly in the form of 1 over k implicitly in the form of mu of t right so somehow the mu of t must change in such a way that on the right hand side even if you change temperature the left hand side must remain constant okay and that is the fact that we will use to figure out what is the dependence of mu on temperature okay so any so, question so far yeah uh, sir how do we define chemical potential in physics uh, physics terms because in chemistry we just uh, say that it's the gibbs free energy by the number of atoms or something like that so Correct. okay so yeah it's a very important question see the thing is uh, in in this particular context in physics mostly we deal with the partition function and if you look at the grand canonical partition function then log of the partition function is related to the helmholtz free energy okay so this uh, del f by del n i'm sorry this is f turns out to be the mu okay at a constant temperature and constant volume so what this is telling you is that the change in the helmholtz free energy is being is given by mu times delta n okay so does that clarify things yes sir yes sir okay in fact we will come back to this because what we want to see is how does this mu change as a function of temperature okay so which means when you change the number of electrons in the system then how does the free energy change okay so does the mu increase as a function of temperature or does the mu decrease as a function of temperature right so that's what we want to see and once we derive this equation okay for mu as a function of temperature then we will try to understand what is happening to the delta f okay any other questions okay we will start with looking at the behavior of the fermi dirac distribution function now remember the fermi dirac distribution function has two variables or in fact it has three parameters so to say it depends on epsilon it depends on mu and it also depends on temperature okay now <clears throat> uh, mu as far as we know depends on temperature but let's for a moment believe that mu doesn't depend on temperature and uh, the justification for this will come out later but let's now try to plot this as a function of energy and as a function of temperature okay so we want to look at what does the f of epsilon comma t do as a function of energy and what does this function do as a function of temperature okay so <clears throat> so at this point i would if if this were a physical class i would have asked one of you to come on to the board and then solve this problem okay but since that is not possible let's start with the uh, people who have joined the meeting so the first person i see is dipanjana patra are you online dipanjana
Hello, Dipanjana, are you online? Okay, I see her, but hmm. so the next person is uh, Surbhi Menon. Okay, so Dipanjana's <laughs> mic is not working. Yeah, so Surbhi, can you look at this function? Okay, the f of epsilon comma t as a function of epsilon, right? And let me write this function also. One over e to the power epsilon minus mu over k b t. Right. So, can you tell us what would happen to this function as a function of epsilon when epsilon is zero? Okay. And let's say somewhere here is the mu, and this let's say is epsilon much greater. Than So can you can you so tell me where epsilon, is, yeah epsilon, uh, epsilon equals to mu we'll get okay. uh, we'll get 1 our probability will uh, be 1 for epsilon F equal e. to mu the probability will be 1 okay so are you saying that if this is 1 then at epsilon equal to mu i should get a number 1 yeah yes sir the Sir, in the okay. half, half, one plus one. Half, correct. One exactly. by two. Yeah, it's half. Yes. Okay, very nice. So this is half. Now, what happens when epsilon is less than mu? Sir, uh, it will be uh, exponentially uh, decaying. So, which means starting from half, I should go down? No, sir. From hmm. one to, uh, it will go till half. Okay, so I should start from one. When epsilon is zero? Yes, sir. What is the justification for that? Why does f become uh, one when epsilon is zero? Sir, the exponential will go zero. Okay, so the uh, for epsilon equal to zero, I get e to the power minus mu by kBT plus one, correct? And yes, you are claiming that e to the power minus mu by kBT is zero, correct? Yes, sir. For less so than. Uh, huh? It's it's tending to zero, right? Yes, sir. It's exponentially small. What is the justification for this? So what you have in mind is that mu is of the order of epsilon f, which is of the order of 10 to the power 5 Kelvin. And if we restrict ourselves to kBT, which is less than or equal to the room temperature, say 100 Kelvin, then this number is going to be extremely, extremely small because this is of the order of e to the power minus, minus 1000. 1000 yes. Okay, so that's very, very small. Okay, so which means that we will be tending towards 1 when we go towards epsilon equal to 0, and then starting from here, we will go to something like this. Right? Yeah, and then it crosses this and then goes to greater than correct. Okay, and uh, what happens as temperature decreases? Let's say T is extremely close to zero. What would what would you expect? So nearly zero. Then. Nearly zero where? What happens at epsilon equal to mu? Sir, at epsilon equal to mu, it's half only. It will always be half, right? For all yes. temperatures, it will be half. Very nice. And then what happens when T tends to zero? How will this function change? So it will uh, keep on. Uh, so will this become flatter or will this become more rapid? It will become more flatter. Flatter, exactly. So which means it goes like this and then comes down, crosses this and then goes to zero. Which means it is actually approaching a step function for t tends to zero. Correct. So this is t equal to zero, and if this is t one and this is t two, then t two is greater than t one is greater than zero. Very nice. Okay. Thank you, Surbi. You can mute yourself. Okay. So Uttam, are you online? Yes, sir. Yeah. So Uttam, can we discuss what happens to the f as a function of temperature? What happens when uh, t is let's say very very large? Yeah. When t is uh, very large, it will be half. Uh, means half, the function okay. will be half. Now, 
yeah so uh, very nice but uh, when we say large what what does large mean large compared to what uh, this compared to this kv uh, i mean sir uh, we take the temperature which is uh, almost uh, means very large than the uh, normal thermal energy of so uh, no the temperature is the thermal energy right so uh, when we say kbt is large then we are saying thermal energy is large but yeah. compared to what what should be on the right hand side so this is uh, means uh, more than the maximum of all uh, we discussed uh, in previous uh, classes that maximum more than the maximum of all photon energy means all the well, okay okay so let's not get into that see the thing is here we are discussing uh, purely the fermi dirac distribution function right so yes, you need to consider what are the energy scales in the problem and forget yes. about phonons photons everything else okay so just look at the fermi dirac distribution function that's all nothing else right okay, and here uh, then large here temperature say, yes when we say large large compared to there are only two energy scales here you see there yes, is sir. an epsilon and there is a mu okay yes, but epsilon is a variable okay yes, sir. epsilon can be either greater than mu or less than mu yes, but mu is a constant is what we considered correct yes so the only thing that kbt can be compared to is the chemical potential yes okay so which means we are at temperatures which are much larger than the chemical potential yeah all right okay so you are saying that when kbt is much greater than mu then the fermi function approaches half okay yes. so this is let's say 1 and this is half very nice okay now what happens now what should i do in between uh when temperature is a uh, purely zero uh, okay so in that case it's uh, actually it's zero it's zero okay so the fermi function is zero when temperature is zero yeah yes okay yes. then um now when it's finite then again we will have to consider this uh, energy and uh, this uh, chemical potential chemical potential correct yeah so when at t equal to 0 this is zero but uh, it will uh, increase accordingly i mean yes, exponentially it will increase okay and it will increase and, and approach half correct right? yeah very nice okay fine is that the only thing that will happen mm. sir it also depends uh, on how this uh, this energy and chemical potential because uh, uh, yes correct absolutely right so what uh, so you have to told me something that it starts from zero and approaches half correct so yes, for which epsilon are you talking about sir this is uh, uh, means ep uh, this mean when this combine epsilon and this um, chemical potential Huh? Uh, this both are means they are not equal any time during this well okay so if it if they are equal then it is going to be equal to half correct yes. very good so when they are equal equal means uh, uh, energy it is equal is it's always equal to half very nice but what we, happens for other epsilon uh, for so will this be true this is for energy greater than uh, mu exactly so this is for energy greater than the chemical potential correct yeah. so you can see that here also when i take the energy to be greater than the chemical potential you can see that the fermi dirac distribution function is increasing yes sir as the temperature increases correct but yes. when epsilon is less than mu i have to start from 1 yeah right and it I decreases and approaches half yeah. so which means this is for epsilon less than mu and yeah. you will see a family of curves okay for all energies greater than mu you will see a family of curves and for all energies less than mu you will see another family of curves right yes okay so have you all seen this kind of a curve before see the same function can have completely different behaviors for epsilon greater than mu and for epsilon less than mu right so okay this is something that you need to remember right so this is as a function of energy the fermi function and this fermi function is as a function of temperature okay so given this 
let's try to now figure out what does the derivative of the fermi function do okay and this is something that is going to be extremely important for us right so and uh, uh, please bear with me this will involve some algebra okay so the df by d epsilon is what we want to find out and here who will help me sohini will you help me here how to find the derivative of the fermi function yes sir okay so tell me what should i write for the df by d epsilon so we want to find out d by d epsilon of 1 over e to the power beta epsilon minus mu plus 1 Uh, we can apply uh, the quotient rule so uh, okay yes hello yes we can i'm sorry i'm getting it no sorry sir Yes, sir. Any, go ahead. Sorry, I I received a call. So, what should I do? Uh, minus. Uh, yes. Uh, e to the power uh, beta uh, e okay. minus mu. Very good. Upon uh, okay. e to the power. Uh, yes. Mm. Uh, then uh, the denominator squared. Very nice. Okay. Anything else? In uh, into beta. Into beta. Very nice. Okay. So thank you. Yeah, you can mute yourself. So what we get is minus one over k bt e to the power beta epsilon minus mu divided by e to the power beta epsilon minus mu plus one whole square. Okay, so uh, if I take minus d f by d epsilon, then it becomes a pos positive function. Okay, so this turns out to be an extremely important function because, as you will see in the derivative of the uh, internal energy and the specific heat and so on, what enters is really the derivative of the Fermi function. Okay. and because the derivative of the fermi function enters we need to understand how does the derivative of this fermi function as a function of energy or as a function of temperature behave okay so let's first look at this function here this is this function is of the form e to the power x divided by e to the power x plus 1 whole square and i can write this as 1 over e to the power x plus 1 Into e to the power minus x plus one. Okay, so uh, it's exactly the same thing. By taking e to the power x down, I I will get this, and uh, and you can see that this function, if I call it g of x, then g of x is actually an even function. So if I change x to minus x, the function doesn't change, which means this part here is an even function. About epsilon equal to mu. So if I reflect the function about epsilon equal to mu, it remains exactly the same. Okay, so that's the first thing to remember, right? Now let me clear this. Okay. So let me. Rewrite this minus d f by d epsilon is <coughs> one over k b t e to the power beta epsilon minus mu divided by and the first thing we decided was that this is an even function about epsilon equal to mu. Okay, so because it is even and it has to reflect exactly about epsilon equal to mu, you can guess that exactly at epsilon equal to mu, 
the derivative or the slope is going to be zero. Okay, so it's either going to be a minimum or a maximum at epsilon equal to mu. Okay, so and it turns out to be a maximum, right? So uh, let me now ask uh, Shomita, are you online? Yes, sir. Yeah. So let's discuss the behavior of this function. Okay, and uh, try to plot this, right? Okay. So let's say this is epsilon equal to mu. So what would be the value at epsilon equal to mu for this function? Uh, one by four kBT. Exactly. So it's one over four kBT. Now, <clears throat> uh, what would happen when epsilon is much smaller than mu? Let's keep the temperature fixed. So remember, this is you can think of it in this way. Okay, e to the power x plus one into e to the power minus x plus one. You can think of it this way. And whether you go to x tends to minus infinity or x tends to plus infinity, you are going to get exactly the same answer. So when x tends to plus infinity, then what happens? Uh, at x tends to plus infinity, e to the power x blows up. Exactly. Uh, so it ultimately gives zero. Zero. So which means it has to vanish when epsilon is much smaller than mu, and it again has to vanish here because it's an even function about epsilon equal to mu. Correct? Yes. And the maximum okay. change will be at epsilon equal to mu. mu so in fact this is going to be slope zero here and it's going to be a peaked function correct yes very nice so the question now is what is the width of this peak how do i find that so i want to know what is the width of this peak okay how do i find that any idea have you heard of this concept called full width at half so maximum full width at maximum exactly yes. yeah full width at half okay. maximum so you already told me that the maximum is at 1 over 4 kbt right yes so what is the half of that yeah correct yeah. so this is 1 over 8 kbt and we want to know What are the energy values at which the function takes the value one over eight kBT? Yes. Okay. So let's call this epsilon half, and this is uh, uh, so this let's say epsilon half minus, and this is epsilon half plus. Just to denote the two uh, uh, two values. Okay. So how do I find this now? How do I find epsilon half and uh, plus minus? Sir, if we uh, put one, go. Show me the yeah. Um, if we yeah, solve Shovik, the. Shovik, I will ask you. Okay, Shovik will come to you. Yes, Shovik, tell me. If we solve uh, the matter, uh, I if I put if D F by D F epsilon is equal to one by eight K B T. Very nice. Okay. And so uh, you are saying epsilon oh. equal to epsilon half plus or minus. If we put that, we should get one over eight kBT. Yes. Exactly. And okay. then we yeah. have to calculate the value of x from exactly. Um, exactly. So expression. let's do that. Okay. So okay. Uh, thanks for this. You can mute yourself. We'll go ahead and calculate this, and then let's see what comes out. Okay. So, <clears throat> so we are saying that one over kBT times e to the power x divided by e to the power x plus one whole square. Is equal to one over eight kBT, which implies that if you now solve this, you will get u squared minus six u plus one equal to zero, where u is basically e to the power beta epsilon minus mu. Okay, and if you solve this further, you will get u is equal to three plus or minus two root two, and this will give you epsilon equal to mu plus or minus. 
1.76 kbt okay so which means that this width here is twice of 1.76 kbt which is roughly 3.5 kbt so what does this teach us okay so the, remember this is a graph of minus del f by del epsilon and that minus is very important okay this is epsilon so this teaches us that as temperature decreases and t goes to zero the height of this function goes to infinity and the width of this function goes to zero right and this reminds us of the dirac delta function correct because the width is going to zero but the height is going to infinity okay but the dirac delta function has one more property okay so shovik you can tell me now what is the other thing that i need to verify to make sure that minus del f by del epsilon is a dirac delta function so total so integration should very be nice. one or okay so we are claiming that limit t tends to 0 should actually be delta of epsilon minus mu and to show this what you are saying is that i need to find out the total area under the integral and make sure that the area under the integral remains constant and in fact should be equal to 1 correct yes sir yeah so roughly one can see here that the height is 1 by 4 kbt and the width is 3.5 kbt so if i multiply these two the temperature will go away and i will get a constant okay so you can see that roughly the area under the integral is going to be temperature independent but let's do this formally and see whether we actually get uh, area equal to 1 so shovik tell me how should i proceed now what should i do sir uh, sir uh, we should integrate minus del f del epsilon into d epsilon from minus okay. uh, infinity to uh, from 0 to infinity from 0 to infinity correct and not what minus would i get ha huh, what would i get first i should get one ha huh, but uh, can you now do this integral and tell me what should i write here huh? hello what is the answer what what should i write next you are going great tell me what what should i write next on the right hand side what is the value of this integral oh, uh, total function uh, df the uh, function uh, infinity at minus function at zero hello uh, function at infinity so what's the function so you mean f of infinity minus f of zero uh, f of zero minus f of infinity Ah, uh, because of the minus yeah. sign, correct? Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Very nice. Okay. And what is f of infinity? F of infinity is zero, and f of zero is one. Yeah. yeah. Because we had discussed that the Fermi Dirac distribution function goes to zero at uh, infinity and becomes one at zero, so which means this is yes. one. Yes. So you can see that the area under the integral of this entire function from zero to infinity is always going to be equal to one, which is temperature independent. so which yeah. means that the dirac delta function limit is approached when t tends to 0 and the area under the integral remains exactly the same and when temperature increases then instead of a dirac delta function we would see a resonance and the width of the resonance is going to be proportional to the temperature in fact it's close to 3.5 kbt and the height of this is going to be 1 over kbt inversely proportional to the temperature okay so you can see that for temperatures Hello? which are yeah sir i just missed you last two words can okay. i just repeat no, i just saying that uh, you can see that the width and the height are going to be proportional and inversely proportional to the temperature respectively correct so as temperature increases the width is going to increase of the df of minus df by d epsilon but the height is going to increase i'm sorry as temperature increases the height is going to decrease and the width is going to increase so it's going to uh, start from a very very sharp dirac delta function this is at t equal to 0 and as t increases it's going to be very very peaked and then it's going to get broader and broader okay so this is as t increases sir yeah 
so will this integral uh, will not be half because when we are taking from zero to infinity it from minus infinity to infinity it should be one but uh, not really no so remember see the fermi function itself we have defined it uh, or the energies this is a free energy this is a free electron problem right and for free electrons the only energy we have is the kinetic energy okay yes. and the kinetic energy is given by h cross square k squared by 2m and if we take the reference as zero then epsilon is always going to be greater than or equal to zero okay so the energy integral is going to be from zero to infinity now comes your question of why shouldn't it be from minus infinity to infinity okay now Sir? the thing is ha huh, i'll i'll just resolve that one minute shobhit so okay. the idea is that so what you are asking is that ideally delta of x dx from minus infinity to infinity should be equal to 1 Okay, but what we are getting here is this. If you see, minus del f by del epsilon is not becoming delta of epsilon; it's actually becoming delta of epsilon minus mu. Okay, yes. so it's a yeah. direct delta function at mu, which is not mm -hmm. equal to zero, right? Mm -hmm. So yes. zero is somewhere here. Yes. Okay, and if you divide it by temperature, then this is going to be equivalent to minus infinity, and this is going to be equivalent to infinity. Okay, so in that sense, this is still a Dirac delta function. And remember, one more thing that uh, we have not considered here is that the mu is actually a function of temperature. So when we change temperature, we must consider the dependence of mu on temperature also, and that is also going to play a role for temperatures which are close to the chemical potential. Yes. Okay, but if we are at room temperature and below, this is absolutely not going to affect us. Yes, yes Shobhit, you had a question. Uh, sir, uh, uh, we uh, here just integrated the function with respect to epsilon. Now, if mm -hmm. we hello, yes, yes, hello. No, but uh, when we derivative with respect to temperature, then uh, there will be term uh, epsilon minus nu. Uh, multiplied by some uh, function, then uh, then the then that temperature variation uh, that means uh, just should depends on the uh, energy. But uh, here we can simply say that uh, the uh, it is uh, the 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 energy dependence of the function is uh, irrespective of uh, whether it is uh, positive uh, greater than mu or less than mu. So how these two uh, no, physics no, coincide? Not, it's, not, it's not depend. It's not independent. in either case it is not independent see this delta function you are getting only when t is equal to 0 okay now first thing okay, we discussed okay. is yeah first thing we discussed this that this function is going to be an even function around epsilon equal to mu so as a function of energy it's an even function okay and it is actually dependent on energy you can see that we have actually plotted it here right so it's yes. dependent on energy right and you are saying that when we take the derivative with respect to temperature again we will get an epsilon minus mu factor out and hence it's dependent on energy so in both cases it's dependent on energy isn't it uh, yes sir yes sir but okay. uh, the uh, the function is uh, same with respect to the chemical potential uh, when we differentiating with respect to energy but uh, when we yeah. but when yeah. we differentiate with respect to the temperature then there will be a function uh, epsilon minus nu so uh, this becomes an odd function so that is so that is what that is what i am trying to figuring out correct, correct. Uh, how you're right you're right so the thing is there are two different variables here and the way epsilon enters the fermi function and the way temperature enters the fermi function are very different right the temperature enters as epsilon minus mu divided by kvt whereas the way energy enters is epsilon minus mu by kvt so the thing is if you differentiate with respect to one of them or the other you are definitely going to expect two different answers in one case we get an even function in the other case we get an odd function okay so that shouldn't be very surprising okay there that means that they, they, they are not interconnected okay no no Okay. See, as long as okay, we sir. consider mu to be independent of temperature, which is what we have done here, epsilon and temperature are two independent variables. Okay, so in that sense, this behavior is expected because they are two independent variables, and the dependence of the Fermi function 
on epsilon and temperature is not the same okay okay sir i understood okay sir. yeah okay so let me just summarize what we found in the next slide and then we can move on so what we found is that minus del f by del epsilon okay limit t tends to 0 is delta of epsilon minus mu and at any finite temperature the minus del f by del epsilon is going to be a very very peak function but uh, we are restricting ourselves to kbt much smaller than the chemical potential so this function is going to be extremely peak the height of this is going to be inversely proportional to the temperature it's 1 by 4 and the width of this is about 3.5 kbt okay so this is something that you must remember because this is what we are going to use in order to find out what is the behavior of the chemical potential on the temperature okay so that's the next thing let's move on to that okay so now let's find out how does the chemical potential depend on temperature okay so before we actually find the answer okay formally let's try to understand how does the chemical potential depend on temperature using qualitative arguments okay so let me draw the permi dirac distribution function so let's say it's something like Hello, this hello uh, sir yes. i have a question yes yes uh, the area under the curve is independent of temperature which one and the uh d f by d epsilon by versus energy is independent of temperature yes well no it's not independent of temperature as t tends to 0 this the height of this will go as 1 over t and the yes. width will go as temperature which means this is for a specific temperature if i draw it for a lower temperature it's going to look something like this it's going to look taller and narrower sorry my drawing is really bad but what will be the area under the curve this is what we also found right we found that minus del f by del epsilon d epsilon unity is going to be one for all temperatures which means so you can see that the height is increasing but the width is decreasing yes so yes. yeah in that sense the area under the curve remains constant equal to 1 does that make yes. sense yes yeah so you can think of it i mean you can approximate this like a rectangle okay where a rectangle the height is 1 by a and the width is a okay so as a tends to 0 basically you will get a delta function and as a becomes uh, finite you will get a rectangle yeah okay so this is one way to think about this okay so let's figure out how does the chemical potential depend on temperature through qualitative reasons okay through qualitative arguments and to understand this let's go back to the definition of the chemical potential okay so this implies delta f is mu times delta n all right so let me now ask uh, anustup are you online yes sir yeah so anustup now tell me uh what happens to this equation at t equal to 0 so let's take this equation at t equal to 0 what how should i think about this so remember you are trying to add something correct the remember delta n is a change of the number okay and let's say you try to add a particle to the system so delta n is plus 1 okay okay then what will be delta f mu mu but what is mu at t equal to 0 fermi energy fermi energy exactly so when we try to add a particle at t equal to 0 right the change in the free energy comes out to be just epsilon f 
okay how do i understand this in terms of the fermi dirac distribution function can you tell me so tell me something if i look at this fermi dirac distribution function what does this tell me that the fermi dirac distribution is is one for all epsilon less than mu or epsilon f and zero for all epsilon greater than mu what does this tell me that this is one the that the probability is one there matlab uh, which means the states are fully occupied fully occupied correct so can yes. i add an electron to the states which are below the fermi energy no sir no right so what is the minimum energy at which i can add an electron at t equal to 0 zero it's going to be the fermi energy right yes sir because only beyond the fermi energy are the states unoccupied yes sir right so which means that the change in the energy of the system is going to be given by the state to which you are adding the electron correct yes sir okay very good so now can you argue whether the change in the Uh, t for t greater than zero, will delta f be less than epsilon f, or will delta f be greater than epsilon f? So can you just repeat it once? Yeah. So I'm asking you that when the temperature increases from zero, okay, we want to understand whether the delta f, the change in the energy, is it going to be greater than epsilon f, or is it going to be less than epsilon f? so what does the change in energy means exactly okay so it means that okay let's think about it from a different angle okay i'll come back to your question hmm? yes uh, if the temperature increases then at what energy can i add an electron so energy less than fermi energy will be available then. i can right because yes, some of the states will become unoccupied there yes sir isn't it and if i add an electron to a state which is smaller than epsilon f right then it means that the system has increased its energy but the increase in energy is is smaller than epsilon f yes sir right so now from here you can see that the delta f is going to be mu correct okay? yes sir but you just now told me that this is the correct option isn't it yes sir so which means that the mu is going to be smaller than epsilon f yes sir okay so as temperature increases we find that more and more states below the fermi energy are going to be depleted okay there is a high probability that they will be unoccupied which means that the chemical potential which is basically giving you the change in the free energy uh, per particle is going to be smaller than the fermi energy okay so the chemical potential is supposed to decrease as a function of temperature okay so that's what we get from this argument that the chemical potential should decrease with increasing temperature So thanks, Anastu. You can mute yourself. Okay, sir. Yeah. So, are there any doubts so far? The, is this argument clear? Why the chemical potential should decrease with increasing temperature? Uh, so can you sir? repeat? Sir. Yeah. Yeah. I went offline for some time. Yeah. So I was saying that uh, <coughs> at t equal to zero, the change in the Fermi energy is going to be exactly equal to the Fermi energy because when we try to change the number in the system right which means let's say we want to add a particle okay then the change in the free energy will be exactly equal to the fermi energy itself and the reason for that the physical reason for that is that 
all the states below the fermi energy are going to be fully occupied and all the states above the free energy are going to be completely occupied unoccupied which means that the smallest energy okay at which i can add an electron is going to be exactly equal to the fermi energy right and now if i go to a higher temperature i find that some of the states below the fermi energy are going to be unoccupied which means there is a finite probability of adding an electron at an energy which is smaller than the fermi energy and uh, that still is a uh, uh, th that is a possibility okay that possibility cannot be negated which means that the delta f will be less than the epsilon f the change in the energy is going to be smaller than the epsilon f okay and that tells us that the chemical potential is going to be smaller than epsilon f as t is greater than 0 and using this qualitative argument i am going uh, i am stating that the chemical potential should actually decrease with increasing temperature okay and what we will find the answer that we will find after doing quite a bit of algebra is going to be the following we will find that mu is given by epsilon f times 1 minus a small constant times kbt divided by epsilon f whole square okay and you can see now that this is going to be a very very small change in the chemical potential as a function of increasing temperature because for room temperature kbt is about 25 milli electron volts okay and the epsilon f is about 1 electron volt okay or in other words if you want to think of it in terms of temperature then this is 10 to the power 2 Okay, of the order of, and epsilon f is of the order of 10 to the power 5. So this number here, this correction to 1, is going to be of the order of 10 to the power minus 6, right? So if you increase temperature, and even if you come to room temperature, the chemical potential is going to differ from the Fermi energy only at the sixth decimal, right? So it's not going to be very different. right so uh, this is the reason why we say that mu is almost equal to the epsilon f even when you come to room temperature okay but this is something that we are going to see now okay we are going to show this formally that the chemical potential depends on the fermi energy in this particular way is this clear so uh, yeah so what does delta f correspond to delta f is the change in the free energy So this is the Helmholtz free energy that we are talking about. Okay. And uh, this takes into account many things. Remember, this is u minus T s. Okay. Yes. So this takes into account not not only the internal energy but also the change in the entropy. Okay. And uh, remember, the entropy is also given here by the uh, you know the number of possible states. Okay. So yes. uh, the thing is, it's not a very straightforward thing to explain. Right. but what we can see from here is that exactly at t equal to 0 the mu is going to be equal to epsilon f and that's why the change in the free energy is going to be epsilon f so if if i write this as u minus t s then you can see that at t equal to 0 there are no entropy effects yes so this goes to 0 and the only change is basically in the change in the internal energy t becomes greater than 0 then the entropy also plays a role So remember, you told me that there is a finite probability of a state being unoccupied, okay? But it's not definitely unoccupied, correct? So you have to consider various different possibilities, and that's where the entropy plays a role. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. It's not a definite state. Yeah. Okay. Any other question? Sir. Yes. Sir, again, the role of delta n is not very clear because uh, we are considering this all explanation for delta n to be positive. Suppose we have to take an electron from the system, then okay. again delta n is going to be negative, and the temperature dependence is going to be something else. Because well, what? Okay, so what you are considering now is if delta n is negative, then what is going to be the delta f? Okay, so you are basically depleting an electron. Correct. Okay. Okay? Okay. Now, depleting an electron, you are saying that the change in the energy is going to be equal to mu. Yes. Correct. Hmm? Now, what happens when t is greater than zero? So, uh, the delta f is again negative. But then, uh, so are you saying that you, there is a finite probability of taking out an electron which is at an energy which is greater than epsilon f? 
sir i am just trying to sir, point out that uh, means again the mu will be strongly dependent on temperature i think now so it will be so the thing is formally we will derive this okay we will derive the dependence of mu on temperature and you will find formally that this is the formula that mu is actually given by epsilon f times 1 minus a kbt by epsilon whole square okay yes. we will find this but to give you a qualitative argument i started with taking delta n to be greater than 0 in fact i took this to be plus 1 yes and that's where it is very clear but if you take delta n to be minus 1 then as you said it is not very clear it can be yes. very confusing yes okay so yes i agree with you because when delta n is equal to minus 1 then there are uh, occupied states below epsilon f and there are unoccupied states or there are there is a possibility of having an unoccupied state even below the fermi energy and there is a possibility of having an occupied state above the fermi energy yes. <coughs> right so the but what i would argue there is that if you consider temperatures which are much smaller then there is a much higher probability of picking up an electron from below the fermi energy rather than from above the fermi energy yes okay so from that i can argue again that mu is going to be smaller than epsilon f. Oh, okay. Okay. Yep. <coughs> okay. So uh, the in the next few slides we will be deriving this equation. Okay. This mu equal to epsilon f times one minus a k b t by epsilon f whole square. So let's see how to do that. Okay. To do that, I'm going to again start from the average number equation, which is given by d epsilon d f by sorry, this is f of epsilon times d of epsilon. Okay, so this is the average number of electrons, and since the chemical potential is uh, uh, is dependent on temperature, it's going to keep the number of electrons in the system fixed. Okay, in some sense, we are not really connecting the system to a source or a drain. It's connected to a reservoir with which it is able to exchange the number as well as the energy, and the reservoir is maintaining a constant number, a constant average number, and a constant average temperature. Okay. so through uh, this energy fluctuations and there will be number fluctuations also in the system okay but uh, on an average the total number is going to be fixed right so using this equation what we will do is that we will take the derivative with respect to temperature and on both sides and by doing that we will find out what is the dependence this will tell us the mu as a function of temperature okay <clears throat> so how do we do this so first of all dn by dt is supposed to be zero the average number is supposed to be zero the average number uh, uh, change as a function of temperature is supposed to be zero so then zero is equal to integral d epsilon times df by dt now this is going to be a large expression times d of epsilon so what is df by dt right now df by dt we had again we did not exactly calculate this but the way to calculate this would be to do a chain rule okay so we will first do df by d of beta times epsilon minus mu of uh, and then d by dt of beta of epsilon minus mu okay so if we do this then we will get d epsilon times this will give us minus e to the power beta epsilon minus mu divided by e to the power beta epsilon minus mu plus 1 whole square and this will give us two terms right because remember the beta is 1 over kbt and the mu here is also dependent on temperature so when we take the derivative with respect to temperature then this will also contribute the beta will also contribute and the mu will also contribute so <coughs> the derivative will turn out to be minus 1 over kbt squared times epsilon minus mu and the second term will give us minus beta d mu by dt okay <coughs> and then there is a d of epsilon okay so this is zero 
so from here i can write down so remember d mu by dt is independent of epsilon which means i can take this number out okay and uh, there is a 1 over kbt squared so there is a 1 over kbt which means there is a beta also here so the beta can be taken out and all that will remain here is a 1 over temperature okay so the d mu by dt this is going to be a large expression is going to be equal to integral d epsilon there is a 1 over t outside e to the power x by e to the power x plus 1 whole square this whole thing times now here there is a epsilon minus mu times d of epsilon where this x is beta times epsilon minus mu and in the denominator I would get again the same thing e to the power x by e to the power x plus 1 whole square but now this epsilon minus mu factor is not there okay I will just get d of epsilon okay so do you all agree with this is there anything I have missed out I have missed something. Can you point it out? Sir, beta. Beta. Where is the... Okay. So, you can see there is a beta here. Right? But here, there is also a minus beta divided by temperature. Okay? So, that beta cancels out. Hmm? So, I have not left out beta. Okay. okay. There is one, one by t term. Yeah. There is a 1 by t which I have written here. Minus sign. So minus. Yeah, minus. That's actually an extremely important thing. Okay. You can see that the minus minus and there is a minus here. So the whole thing is going to be plus plus. So if I take this on the other side, I will get an extra minus sign. Okay. And this minus sign is going to be crucial because this is going to tell us that the d mu by dt is going to be negative. Okay. But we have to show that. Okay. It's not going to be straightforward. We have to show that this number here. Okay. The uh, right hand side without the minus sign is actually a positive number okay and that's not going to be entirely trivial right so there we will be using the fact that the e to the power x divided by e to the power x plus 1 whole square is a highly peaked function okay so let's uh, remove this part i want to keep that because that's a large expression and then analyze that so can you just repeat the last five seconds yeah sure so I was saying that uh, the you know when we discussed the Fermi function and when we discussed the derivative of the Fermi function we saw that uh, the derivative of the Fermi function is a highly peaked function right so that fact is going to be crucial here in order to understand why the right hand side without the minus sign is a positive number okay and because the right hand side will turn out to be a positive number without this minus sign the d mu by dt will turn out to be negative and what that is telling us is that as temperature increases the mu decreases telling you that if delta t is positive delta mu has to be negative and the mu decreases with temperature okay so this is what we will show from here is that clear yes sir okay comes about okay so <clears throat> now what we can see here is that this x is actually beta times epsilon minus mu and there is a d of epsilon here which is the density of states this is also the density of states right now e to the power x divided by e to the power x plus 1 whole squared even without the 1 over t okay it's a highly peaked function at x is equal to 0 okay and <clears throat> remember that the width of this is of the order of 3.5 right so that is something that we are going to use here right and uh, you can see here that this d of epsilon okay which is basically this x is beta times epsilon minus mu this d of epsilon is going to be picked up at epsilon equal to mu 
So what we are saying is that this function here is peak at epsilon equal to mu and in fact it turns out to be 1 over t times this turns out to be a delta function at epsilon equal to mu when t when the temperature goes to 0 which means that the d of epsilon is important only near epsilon equal to mu okay in some sense what we are saying is that the derivative of the fermi function is a highly peaked function and the density of states is a very broad function like this right so you can see that if i take the product of these two then the fermi function the derivative of the fermi function has gone to zero beyond these two limits okay is exponentially small which means that these parts of the density of states no matter how it behaves <coughs> is not going to be important okay and the density of states behavior in this range is all that matters okay and if the density of states is smooth enough i can do a taylor's expansion around the chemical potential and that taylor's expansion is going to help me to do this integral analytically okay so the idea is that because this is a highly peaked function at uh, x is equal to 0 or at epsilon equal to mu the d of epsilon can be expanded around d of mu around the epsilon equal to mu and i can write a taylor's expansion for the density of states okay so there will be higher order terms of course but we can take just the linear term and then start analyzing this equation okay so is the is this point clear that i can do a taylor's expansion of the density of states around epsilon equal to mu it's a valid thing to do okay so if that is uh, understood then let's take d mu by dt and then substitute first of all the d of mu inside this okay so you can see that if i substitute d of mu here there is it becomes a constant there is an epsilon minus mu here and there is also an epsilon minus mu inside the exponential right now this is an even function but this thing when it multiplies this becomes an odd function okay and when i integrate an odd function remember this is from zero to infinity but when i do the uh, when i take this make this substitution x is equal to beta epsilon minus mu the integral zero to infinity of d epsilon goes to integral minus beta mu to infinity over dx okay and if mu is much greater than temperature then this can be approximated as minus infinity to infinity hence this integral is from minus infinity to infinity of an odd function and that will give us zero so in the numerator the first term will not contribute and only the second term will contribute okay so that will give us minus then 1 over t integral minus infinity to infinity dx e to the power x by e to the power x plus 1 whole square of x squared by beta squared and then d dash of mu okay and in the denominator i would get in the same way dx e to the power x divided by e to the power x plus 1 whole square and then <coughs> d of mu so in the denominator you can see that the only the first term will survive and the second term will give you zero okay because that becomes an odd function so if you simplify this then you will see that there is a minus d dash of mu divided by d of mu that comes out there is a 1 by t and there is a 1 by beta squared also so there is a kb squared t squared times just i2 by i0 now what is i2 and i0 a general integral i n as minus infinity to infinity dx e to the power x by e to the power x plus 1 whole square for n okay. and you can see that this is just going to be a number 
this i2 by i0 is just a number it does not depend on temperature okay so that's the most important thing so let me just erase this Yeah, so this is uh, KBT squared by T, and the density of states. If you remember for three D, then the density of states is given by a constant times square root of energy. Okay, so which means if I find out d of mu, it's going to be d naught times mu to the power half, and if I find the derivative, then that derivative is going to be d naught by two mu to the power half. Okay, so when I take this ratio of d dash by d, then the d naught is going to cancel, okay, and all I will get from here is minus one over two mu. I two by I zero is a constant. Let me call that a small a, and then k b squared t, and that's it. Okay, so this tells us that d mu by d t, after all that algebra. Is equal to minus a k b squared by two t by mu. Okay, and if I integrate this equation, mu d mu is equal to minus a k b squared t d t. Then from here I will get mu squared by two from zero to t is equal to minus a k b squared. There is a by two also. Minus a k b squared by two times t squared by two from zero to t. But we know that at t equal to zero, the mu is equal to epsilon f. So this tells us that mu squared minus epsilon f squared is equal to minus a k b squared by two times t squared. Okay. So this tells us that mu squared is equal to epsilon f squared. Into one minus a small number, okay, a k b squared by two times t squared by epsilon f squared. Okay, so okay, so if we now take the square root on both sides. Then we will get mu is equal to epsilon f times one minus a by two k b t by epsilon f. This will become four k b t by epsilon f whole square. Okay, so this is uh, there is there is always a uh, this here. Okay, we have done Taylor's expansions. We have taken k b t to be much smaller than epsilon f and so on. Okay, so this is telling us that the chemical potential. decreases as a function of temperature but it's a very very weak function of temperature okay for any normal bulk system where the epsilon f is of the order of 10 to the power 5 kelvin but what is more important and also significant to remember that mu is a function not of temperature alone okay mu is a function of kbt divided by epsilon f okay um let me call this some some function This is important because this is telling us that the Fermi energy is the characteristic energy scale in the problem, okay? and uh, the dependence of chemical potential on temperature is through this ratio of the thermal energy to the Fermi energy. Okay? It's not independent of the Fermi energy, right? So that's one thing to remember. Then the yeah, so uh, so this is one thing. Okay, so are there any doubts so far? is this formal derivation of mu dependence on temperature clear sir can i ask a question yes yes go ahead hello yeah go ahead go ahead shavik ask i can't hear you hello ha ah, tell me hello yes I can hear you. You can speak.
Okay, I think his network is not good. Shovik, your network is not good. So let's look at the specific heat now. Okay, and uh, we will do exactly the same kind of uh, algebraic manipulations as we did for the chemical potential. So let's start with Tu by dt, and that will be given by zero to infinity d epsilon epsilon times df by dt times d of epsilon. So we have already calculated df by dt, so we'll just substitute that. Shovik, if you come online, let me know what your question was. So we'll do two things here. One is to subtract chemical potential and add the chemical potential. Okay. So, since we have subtracted this, we need to add this as well and we will get plus mu times integral 0 to infinity d epsilon df by dt times d of epsilon. Now, <coughs> so all I have done is I have subtracted mu and then added mu the, and the reason I did that was remember df by dt is a function only of epsilon minus mu. Right, so I want to get everything here as a function of epsilon minus mu, and on the on this side you can see that this whole thing is basically dn by dt, which is zero. Okay, so this is not going to contribute, right, to the temperature dependence, and hence we can write this as integral zero to infinity d epsilon of epsilon minus mu, and then we can write the expression for df by dt and df by dt is a, it's a big expression it's a minus e to the power beta epsilon minus mu divided by e to the power beta epsilon minus mu plus one whole square and there are going to be two contributions one is minus epsilon minus mu by kbt squared and the second contribution is this coming from the change in the chemical potential. Now what we just discussed was that the chemical potential dependence of temperature is extremely weak. So let's drop this as a first approximation. Okay, You can in fact take this into account also and it's not very difficult. Uh, I mean those of you who are inclined to do this please go ahead take this result this mu as a function of uh, temperature take the derivative substitute that here and see what you get okay so i would encourage you to do that now if we take this further you can see that there is a epsilon minus mu here and there is a epsilon minus mu here right but there is also a minus sign there is also a minus sign so we get a plus and this epsilon minus mu becomes a whole square okay so we will get integral 0 to infinity d epsilon epsilon minus mu whole square divided by k b t whole square with an extra k b and then this becomes e to the power beta epsilon minus mu divided by e to the power beta epsilon minus mu plus 1 whole square times d of epsilon. Now again we know that this is a highly peaked function at epsilon equal to mu so we will take the Taylor's expansion of this and only the first term will survive because the second term will give an odd function and that will not survive. Okay, So this becomes equal to Kb times <coughs> d of mu and when I substitute epsilon minus mu by Kbt an extra Kbt will come out. Okay, And we will get integral minus infinity to infinity x squared times e to the power x divided by e to the power x plus 1 whole square. So this is a number again of the order of 1. right? So this becomes proportional to d of mu times temperature. Okay. So what we have shown now is that the specific heat is proportional to the density of states at the chemical potential 
टाइम से टेम्परेचर ओके सो द स्पेसिफिक हीट इज लीनियर विद रिस्पेक्ट टू टेम्परेचर एंड इट ऑल्सो डिपेंड्स ऑन द डेंसिटी ऑफ स्टेट्स एट द केमिकल पोटेंशियल राइट एंड इफ वी राइट द फॉर्मूला फॉर द डेंसिटी ऑफ स्टेट्स देन इट टर्नस आउट टू बी इक्वल टू थ्री एन बाई टू टू एम बाई एच क्रॉस स्क्वेड टाइम्स वी बाई थ्री पाई स्क्वेड एन टू द पावर टू बाई थ्री सो वॉट यू कैन सी इज दैट द डेंसिटी ऑफ स्टेट्स इज एक्चुअली प्रोपोर्शनल टू द मास बट रिमेंबर दिस वॉज द बेयर मास right and if we take this expression then the density of states should be exactly the same for all systems whether they had s orbital bands whether they had p orbital bands or d orbital bands no matter what okay but it turns out that that is not the case if you take this expression and try to predict the specific heat coefficient specific heat coefficient is defined as gamma which is cv by t okay if you try to find this experimentally you will find that the cv by t as found by theory by this free electron theory and as found by experiment for metals like gold and uh, you know silver turn out to match very well okay gamma experiment and gamma theory match very well for materials like gold and silver but if you try to do the same thing let's say for iron or cobalt or nickel you will find that gamma theory is much greater than gamma experiment okay and <clears throat> why this happens is because there are partially filled d bands in these systems and these partially filled bands are extremely narrow they have a very high density of states near the fermi level and because of that the specific heat coefficient turns out to be much larger than that, than that of the uh, sorry this is i have written it uh, ulta actually the gamma experiment turns out to be much bigger than the gamma theory and this kind of a thing is absorbed in an effective mass okay so m star is gamma experiment divided by gamma theory okay and this is called an effective mass so <clears throat> the effective mass in these partially filled d systems can actually be much greater than 1 okay and uh, in fact there are systems called uh, quantum critical systems where this effective mass can be tuned to infinity okay you can make the effective mass of electrons as large as you want by going as close as as close as possible to the uh, quantum critical point okay which is the similar to a classical critical point let's say in water that you have seen but in the quantum case there are no thermal fluctuations you can only change uh, the system's phase as you tune an a thermal parameter okay, for example pressure or doping or magnetic field so these are all a thermal parameters so you can tune the system's ground state by tuning this a thermal parameter okay and at the critical point like in water the liquid and gas coexist uh, exactly like that at the qcp at the quantum critical point two ground states can coexist they become degenerate okay but close to the critical point if you are in the metallic phase the effective mass can actually diverge okay so that's a very interesting thing and in fact uh, that signals the transition to a phase where the uh, electrons become localized okay they get heavier and heavier and heavier and ultimately their uh, uh, their itinerancy dies okay they are not able to move anymore and they get completely localized so that happens in many systems in fact even in the high temperature cuprate superconductors it's supposed to happen in heavy fermion systems it's supposed to happen and so on okay. so those of you are interested in knowing more about this just let me know i will send you some articles <clears throat> okay so we are done today if you have any questions you can ask me now hello sir yeah um we have two types of specific heat cv and cp sure. but in case of solids we mostly talk about cv and not the cp Mm -hmm. What is the reason behind this? <coughs> It's easier. So, is it because uh, the difference becomes very small? It becomes very small, actually. So the thing is, uh, the first thing is, uh, when you talk about the real experiments, okay, in real experiments we do have expansions. Okay, so there is a work done uh, due to this expansion of the solid, but uh, usually outside is either vacuum or air, 
and uh, uh, the work done is not very great okay that's the first thing uh, real experiments are definitely done at constant pressure and not at constant volume so when you change the temperature of any sample you are not enclosing that solid sample inside a rigid container and then changing the temperature obviously correct yes you have a sample you connect that to some electrodes or you uh, heat the sample or whatever but let the sample expand okay but it turns out in solids as you also mentioned that the change in the specific heat at constant volume or sorry the specific heat at constant volume and the specific heat at constant pressure they are not extremely different okay unlike in uh, gases and other uh, systems where the difference between these two can be quite large in fact in ideal gas we know that it's equal to the universal gas constant right it's very large cp minus cv is r but that's yeah. not true in solids and it's also numerically very convenient okay you just have to find the expectation value of the hamiltonian and uh, from that uh, you get the internal energy and then take the derivative with respect to the temperature so if you had to do this for the specific heat as a, as a, at uh, cp it would be much more complicated yes okay okay sir thank you yeah <clears throat> sir i had a question yeah Uh, sir, uh, uh, in uh, solid uh, crystalline system, the uh, particle to particle or uh, system to system distance is of the order of one angstrom. Then uh, the mean free path of the electrons is of the order of ten to the power four angstrom. So uh, why this uh, the large difference uh, is there? Is it because of KBT by uh, Fermi energy? Uh, can, you, uh, can you repeat that question again? Sorry, I didn't understand your question. Uh, sir, uh, sir, the in, uh, the lattice parameter is of the order of one angstrom in a system, uh, but okay. the uh, but the mean free path of the electrons uh, is of the order of ten to the power four or ten to the power five angstrom. Uh, so, but why the, the there is large difference in order of the mean free path of the electrons? Be, because. Uh, Uh, because uh, because I was asked this in an interview and I tried to say uh, with KBT by if so on if turn but they are not satisfied. I see. Okay, so let me start restart the interview once again then for you. Okay, so let's consider a perfectly periodic crystal. Correct. So in a perfectly periodic crystal, is going to be the mean free path. lattice parameter so you are claiming that in a perfectly periodic crystal the electron is going to suffer collisions no no there won't be travels, any collision <laughs> after it travels every one angstrom are you claiming that there will be no uh, collisions right in a no, there won't be crystal ha ah, there's Hello? a block theorem yeah, yeah so the block theorem tells you that the electron's wave function is completely delocalized which means it's not going to suffer any collisions throughout the motion throughout the crystal so the mean free path of the electron in a perfectly periodic crystal is what it will be very large infinity 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 right in an ideal periodic crystal it's going to be infinity so yeah. now let's now consider what makes it finite okay potential some potential or some description to the, no, the uh, total uh, delocalization no but just now you told me right there is a periodic potential in the crystal but whenever the periodicity is broken then broken. Uh, there correct. will be correct scattering from so those that points is, that is one possibility so you have given yeah. me one possibility that let's break the periodic potential okay so the periodic potential can be broken by introducing impurities for example dislocations yes. substitutional impurities and all kinds of things okay but now let me consider keeping the periodic potential intact okay and still i am claiming that there is going to be a change in the mean free path by some other mechanism what could be that other mechanism there is bragg reflection also but bragg reflection is not going to change the mean free path that's remember that bragg reflection is only in the brillouin zone in the momentum space not in yes. real space uh 
So now, so by uh, that, what I mean is that let's say if an electron is traveling with a certain momentum h cross k, then if it's a, it's if it's a perfectly periodic crystal, that h cross k is not going to scatter into any other h cross k dash. Okay, there is no scattering mechanism. Remember. So in in effect, what I'm asking is, what could be a different scattering mechanism which will operate even in the presence of the periodic potential? What about lattice vibrations? Yes, there can right. be electron and phonon interaction. Exactly, electron phonon interaction, system. right? Yes. Anything else? There, in other systems, there can be electron magnon interactions. Electron magnon. Like this. Yes. What else? What about electrons with other electrons? Yes, it is also possible. Electron electron interaction, right? Yes, and as you said, electrons with impurities, yeah, dislocations, and all of these turn out to be inelastic scattering. See, the scattering of the electrons with respect to the periodic potential turns out to be elastic scattering. Okay, and you get completely constructive interference, which is the essence of the Bloch's theorem. Right. So, <clears throat> in that sense, the electron doesn't get scattered when there is a purely periodic potential. But now, what you can do is you can think of this each of these different mechanisms, and then you can talk about why is it that the mean free path, or how will the mean free path depend on the temperature? Okay, and for each of them, you need to know what is the damping rate. How does the damping rate depend on temperature? So for electron electron interactions how does the damping rate change for electron phonon interactions how does the damping rate change and so on okay and that is going to determine the resistivity so it turns out that the resistivity is of this form if i take plus some rho not so this is due to impurities this is due to phonons at very low temperatures okay and this is due to electron electron so this is electron phonon okay and now starting from here as you said if i take the ratio kbt by epsilon f okay and come to room temperature then i can see that the uh, mean free path is definitely going to be smaller but it's not very easy to argue that it's going to be of this number of this order okay you can see that the xi uh, is infinity at t equal to 0 and the xi is going to be finite as t tends to as t is finite but what is that number going to be that number is going to depend a lot on what is your a what is your b at what temperatures you are and so on okay is that okay chovi i guess it's okay uh, sir yeah Uh, like, could you explain why uh, the electron uh, won't suffer collisions in periodic? Hello. Hello. I have no idea about it. Uh, just one second. So, uh, is this Disha? Ah, uh, yeah. So, can you repeat that question loudly, bit? No, actually, I I don't know why electrons uh, they don't uh, suffer collision in periodic lattices. Oh, okay, why? fine. So we will come to that. Actually, it turns out that the if you have a completely periodic potential. then the translation uh, uh, the yeah the translation operator and the hamiltonian they actually commute okay and if you try to find the common eigen basis for both of them they turn out to have a certain form okay they have a form which is e to the power ikx times uk of x this is the bloch's theorem and this tells you that the electrons have the every wave function in the system will have a definite momentum okay and if it has a definite momentum which means that it is propagating first of all and it doesn't scatter the momentum doesn't change okay so we will come to this when we do band theory see remember we are currently dealing with electrons which do which are in a free box okay or in a free box with periodic boundary conditions which means there is no periodic potential in the next step we will bring back the periodic potential okay and when we bring back the periodic potential we will see that even then the free electron theory works very well okay there is a way to take the free electron theory further 
and consider the presence of the periodic potential as well okay so we have not come to that so i mean because shovik asked me a question i had to go back to that but but we will come back to this okay and that's the essence of the blocks theorem okay sir yeah so my connection so, was lost can can you just repeat after roti or yeah yeah sure so i was saying that see the precise numbers for the mean free path are not easy to guess okay because the resistivity you can see it depends on electron electron interaction as at squared on electron phonon as bt to the power 5 and due to impurities it's a temperature independent term which is rho not okay so it turns out that for each of these you have to consider what is the damping rate and to consider the damping rate of each of these you have to do certain quantum mini body calculations okay there are qualitative ways to also understand this but that involves you know much more uh, many more arguments so we will come back to this when we do boltzmann transport formalism because in the boltzmann transport formalism we will have to consider each of these different interactions and there we will try to argue okay what is the damping rate due to electrons and phonons interaction what is the damping rate due to electron electron interactions and so on okay okay sir thank you yeah yeah okay so